Hello class, welcome back. Today is lecture four and we'll be talking about properties of probability functions. Um, so the basic idea is that there are rules that um, probability functions just from the definition of what they are will automatically follow. So it doesn't matter like which specific probability function you're talking about, these rules will automatically be true. Um, and that's because they come from the uh, first, the, that, the rules that are in the definition, which is that the, the probability of uh, omega has to be one and that you can add probabilities of disjoint events. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll call this a theorem. And it's gonna have many parts. So this will be just the first part of the theorem. So the first new um, rule, or you can think about these as formulas often in practice, is that if I want to know the probability of a complement occurring, all I have to do is subtract the probability of a uh, from one. Um, so I'm gonna prove it. This is not a proof class, so you don't have to know how to prove things, but it's good to see proofs at least to see why things work. So why does this formula work? Um, so it's really because the probability of the sample space has to be one, always for any probability function. Um, and secondly, we can do a little trick here. So proofs often involve little tricks like this. Um, the trick to this is that the sample space omega, that's got everything in it. And so what you can do is you can always write it as an event union, the complement of that event, because whatever A has, A complement doesn't. So together they make up the whole sample space. Um, and then, oh, also, of course, they don't intersect at all. The, the, the event and its complement don't intersect at all. So that's the empty set. So they're disjoint. Um, so then we can use our probability formula, which says that if you have disjoint events, then you can just add the probabilities of, if you have a union of two events. So we can do that. But then this guy is just one up here. So that's just one. And then you just subtract uh, on one side and you end up with what we're looking for. So that's the little formula to calculate the probability of uh, the complement of an event. Um, you can also sort of visualize this using Venn diagrams. So with Venn diagrams, this rectangle represents um, the sample space and you wanna think about area of this guy as being the probability. So, um, so the total area would be one in that case. Because these, the probability of the uh, sample space is one. And then if you have an event in here, A, then the outside is green stuff. That would be a complement. So if you have A and A complement, their total area is going to add up to one. That's what this is really saying. Um, but that's the same as what we did up here. This is just visual. Okay, so that's the first part of the theorem. So a couple more uh, facts. So the probability of the empty set will always be zero. So intuitively that there is no chance that no outcomes happen when you do an experiment. And that's because um, an outcome has to happen by definition. So 
to prove this seems kind of obvious, but the proof is a bit trickier. Um, the trick here is that if what what's the complement of omega? Well, that's actually the empty set. So omega has everything in it. So everything that's not in omega is just the empty set. There's nothing left. This guy has all the outcomes. So the complement has none because by definition, the complement has only things that are not in the set you're talking about. Um, so then with this fact in mind, then uh, we can do this calculation very quickly. So then probability of no outcomes happening, probability of the empty set is the probability of omega complement, but that's just one minus, because of this formula we just used, one minus um, the probability of omega, which is one minus one, which is zero. Okay, so that's that one. Um, next up is something to do with subsets. So here, um, if you have a subset A inside of B, well, then it better have a smaller probability of occurring than the probability of B because there's fewer outcomes in it is the idea. So, oh, sorry, let me that. So, there, so it's less likely to occur, and that's what this is saying. Um, so let's prove it. Visually, this one's really easy if you just think about it visually, like I did before. Well, A is inside of B, so it's got less area in it automatically, so it's got less probability of happening. Um, but a more formal proof is trickier. What we're going to do is we're going to use this trick that you can always do. Um, so if you have a set and another set, you can break it into these two pieces like this that I'm going to do. So you can think about it as the stuff in B that intersects A um, together with the stuff in B that intersects A complement. Um, so let me just do a side picture to, to, to show you what this is all about. Um, so let's forget about subsets for a second and just think about having two sets A and B. So what I can do is I can think about the stuff in B that's also in A, that would be this stuff. And the stuff that's in B that's not in A, um, so that would be this stuff. So it's in B, but not in A. And together, if I put them back together, I just get B again. So that's what I'm doing. I just union these back together, I go back to B and B. So it's just saying that if you have two sets, you can think about the parts of it that are in one, but not the other. Um, or sorry, the parts of it that are in A separately from the parts that are not in A. So it's a little trick here. Um, but in fact, because of the subset situation, this actually becomes something else simpler. So this will stay the same. But what is A intersect B? Well, if A is inside of B, this is just A. Um, so A is inside of B, then their intersection, the stuff that they have in common, is just this A, which is inside of B. Um, so we can write B like this. The reason we want to do it is also because these two pieces will always be disjoint. And we can see that in this picture over here. The red and the green are disjoint. These two pieces are, are disjoint. And it's because you're taking the parts of B that are in A and the parts of B that are not in A, and those are separate because being in A and not being in, in A, you can't have that at the same time. So those two are, are separate completely. 
And we need them to be disjoint because then I can do the probability using my uh, simple, the, the rule, rule two, which is that if they are disjoint, then I can just add them. And um, so then probability of B is equal to probability of A plus a little bit of extra. This is gonna be some number possibly bigger than zero. So that means that this guy is bigger than this guy because you need to add a little bit extra to it to get to probability of B. Okay, so that's that one. Um, so what else? So now the probably the most important one is the probability of a union um, where there's not ne they're not necessarily disjoint. So I want to find a formula for this thing in general. Um, so before I prove it explicitly, let's do the visual. The visual representation is actually pretty nice and makes it pretty clear. So if I'm thinking about something like this, and I'm thinking about P of A being the area in the bubble A and P of B being the area in the bubble B, then um, this guy is just going to be like how much area there is total there. Um, so what can I do? Well, I can say like, well, what if I just add the two areas together? So I do this area, and then I add this other area. Let's do a different color here. Well, what happens is the middle piece, let me put it in red here, that's been counted when I added there, and that's been counted when I added here. So. So this piece in the middle here, the intersection has been double counted. And that's really just the probability of a intersect B. If you remember, that's what the, the middle piece is, it's the intersection. So basically, if I just want this area, I have to subtract this middle piece because I've double counted it. So it's just gonna end up being, add the probabilities together, but then because you double counted the intersection, subtract uh, the intersection once. So visually, that's sort of how this, this equation can be thought of, um, but let's actually prove it nicely. Um, so the formula is gonna turn out to be this. Okay, so we're gonna use some tricks are a little bit tougher. Um, well, not tougher, but we just saw one of them. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite A in terms of disjoint components. So we're going to do the same trick I did before. So I want to have the pieces of A that are in B and the pieces of A that are not in B. So that's um, how I can say that. So so I'm just breaking A into disjoint parts here. So the outcomes in B separate from the ones not in B. Okay, so keep that in, in your back pocket for later. And then we're gonna do a similar trick Um, but with A union B. So it's a bit weirder. So A union B is its own set. It's the set of things where you take all of A, take all of B, put it all together. Um, so 
I can still do the same thing, same kind of trick, but I'm going to need like these extra parentheses here. So I'm going to take the parts in A union B that are in B, and I'm going to separate them from the parts of A union B that are not in B. So it's really the same trick, except A has been replaced by A union B. But it's really the same trick of splitting it into parts because the, the point is I need to be able to use my formula, I need to have disjoint um, events. And now I do. So this and this are disjoint for the same reason that these two were. It's because we are separating the, the outcomes in A union B into two sets, into the ones in B and the ones not in B. That's what these two sets really are. These are the ones that are in B and these are the ones that are not in B because I'm intersecting them with either B or not B. Okay, so now we have these two little formulas and because they're in disjoint pieces, we can use the definition of probability function to break the probabilities up. So I'll just rewrite it uh, like this again, just to remind you. So, so we have this way of breaking up A, and now because these two guys are disjoint, I can just add the probabilities separately. So we get that. And then same, same for the other guy that we did. So, so this one, uh, we did the same type of thing. So these are the ones in B um, and then the ones not in B. Uh, sorry, Let's see. I need to erase them. I need an extra parentheses. I have so many parentheses. All right, like that. Um, A, not in B. Okay, so like that. Um, so then, because those are disjoint again, meaning the, this and this are disjoint, like I said before, you can now do it um, separately. So you can say this probability plus this probability. And so this looks a bit confusing, but um, there's some tricks to this. So, so this thing here is really just B. Um, so if you think about it, it's A union B, but then intersecting B. So then you're just saying it's the stuff in the union that's actually just in B. So that's why this is just B and you can draw a little picture to convince yourself. So this would be A union B, but then I just intersect it with only B. And so I just get back to B again. So that's just B. Um, and then this one is actually just A intersect B complement. So why is that? Let's see. So now I'm doing um, A union B. And then I'm intersecting it with everything not in B. So I guess I need the rectangle since I'm doing a complement. So everything not in B would be like all this stuff. So what's that going to be? 
that's just going to be stuff that's in A, but not in B, AKA this stuff here. Okay, so that's why that's going to be that. So let me just simplify it. P of B plus P of A intersect B component. That was for this one. Okay, so now we have these two equations um, and we're gonna stick them together, these two here. Let me just write this one underneath it. So that we have them right next to each other. And you'll notice that they both have the same term. They have this term in common here. Um, so if I just subtract the equations, it'll uh, delete that for us. So then I'm gonna get P of A union B minus P of A equals P of B minus P of A intersect B. Um, and then I just gotta rearrange some stuff. So if I just add P of A over, then I get the equation that I wanted, which is this one. Okay, so that's the, um, formula for the probability of a union when there is overlap, AKA they're not disjoint. Okay. Um, so let's do an example where we can use this stuff that we just learned. So let's think about if we have two events, for a sample space. And let's just assume that we know some stuff about the probabilities of these events. So let's just pretend we know that this is 3 tenths. Um, we know that this probability of B is 5 tenths. And we know that this probability of A union B is 7 tenths. Okay, so we know these three things, then let's let's calculate some stuff. So let's find the probability of the intersection. So now this is sort of like when you're asking, what's the probability of rolling an even number or a number bigger than two, um, if you're talking about dice. Now there's an overlap between those two events. So we can't just add the probabilities together and we have to take advantage of this new formula. Okay, so for this one, um, well, we're just gonna directly use what we just figured out, which is that this is true. So this is true for any probability function. Um, so I don't have to know any more details about the function. I can use it just because it is a probability function. Okay, so then I just gotta plug this stuff in. So this is 3 tenths. This is 5 tenths, and the one on the left is 7 tenths. So I can solve for this guy just by subtracting, and I end up getting um, 1 tenth by subtracting over and then dividing out the negative. OK, so that's that. Um, we could do sort of like more complicated ones. Uh, what about something like this? So it gets more complicated because you have to sort of use previous things that you learned that you might not remember off the top of your head. Um, so here, it's all, you know, it's sort of hard. So you can think about it many different ways. You might think like, okay, well, I know how to do, I, we just learned this property. So maybe that'll help me. Um, and then maybe I could use the union formula on complements or something. Um, so I just give you sort of the way that works, but of course you can try things that don't work first and then um, pause the video and get the answer if you want. Um, but there's lots of things you could try. So one thing to try um, that, that definitely will work is using this. 
So if you remember the rule that we learned a long time ago um, is that if you have the union of two complements, that's the same as intersecting first and then doing the complement. Um, so then if we do this, it'll be pretty quick to get the answer. So now I can just find the probability of this guy instead. But, oops, I definitely need an extra parentheses there or else it's wrong. Um, so then I can use that complement rule, which is this one that I wrote here, but instead of A, I have A intersect B. So the probability of A intersect B complement, it's the same rule, anything complement, you just do one minus the probability of that thing. So now that thing, instead of just being A, is A intersect B. Um, but then this guy, we, uh, let's see, was this one we were given? No, yeah, no, this is the one that we figured out. So this was the one that was right here, uh, one tenth. So this is nine tenths. One minus one tenth is nine tenths. Okay, so that's that one. And the last one is, is a bit more tricky just because there's not going to be uh, one quick trick that, that gets you the answer like in this one, it's a few more steps. Okay, so this one, there's only a complement on one of them. So we can't just do what we did here, uh, unfortunately. Can't do a trick like that. You can, but it'll sort of just get more complicated. Um, instead, we're gonna use this other trick that we've used a few times now, which is I can break apart one event in relation to another event. So I could say, what are, I mean, the reason you might think to do this is because you're mixing a complement with a non-complemented thing. Um, okay, but in any case, so you, you can break B into pieces. You can say, I want the pieces that are in A separate from the pieces that are not in A. Um, so notice when I used the tr this trick before, I may have done it in a different order, but the intersections and unions are commutative is the key word. So you could, you could totally write it this way instead. Um, exchanging the order doesn't matter in general. So in general, A intersect B equals B intersect A and A union B is B union A. It doesn't matter which order you do it. Okay, so in any case, uh, I'm gonna stick to using this one because it's already, it looks nicer because it looks like what's right there. Okay, so then these are disjoint, disjoint events by definition, although I don't really need that they're disjoint anymore because I could use that other formula, um, but it does make it quicker if they are disjoint because then I don't have to subtract anything. Um, okay, so then because they're disjoint, probability of B, equals probability of A intersect B plus probability of A complement intersect B. And I think we know some of these. So probability of B was given to us. I have a terrible memory, so I have to go remember five tenths. This we figured out to be one tenth, I believe. And then this last thing is the thing we're trying to figure out. So now we can figure it out. Um, so we get four tenths. Okay, so when you do problems like this, just be aware of using these kinds of tricks. Um, so, and there's more tricks. So there's like the distributive property. Um, so, so like you could also Do something like this. If there were three sets, then you might end up using this property or something. Oops. Um, so just be aware that there are even more tricks than the ones I've done. Um, can't can't do them all. But yeah, try your best on the examples on the lecture problems. Okay. 
Um, so then the last thing I want to do today is think about uh, extending the definition of probability function to include um, sample spaces that have infinitely many things in them. So we can extend the definition of probability function to include sample spaces with, so we have to be a little bit careful here. You might not know this word, um, depends if you've taken a set theory class. So don't worry about it if you don't know it. Um, but we're just gonna think about countable infinity. So that just means a sample space where you can just list all infinitely many outcomes. Um, so the set of numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, forever, that's countably infinite because I can just list them out. But uh, the real numbers, which is called R, is actually too many. And so you cannot write them in a nice list like that. Um, so we're extending the definition to things like this, but not this. Okay, um, so here's how we do it. So basically we just need another rule Um, and this rule needs to deal with what happens if you try to add infinitely many probabilities. So it's going to look like this rule. But um, so where these are destroying. But um, for infinite many events. So if you just include the rule for two, um, then you could use that rule to prove that this will also work as long as all three events are disjoint. Um, and you can use it to show that it works for four or five or six and so on but you can't use it to show that it works for infinitely many. So you actually need to add that as its own rule. So here's the rule. Um, so to be a probability function on an infinite sample space, a countably infinite sample space, um, if you have infinitely many events, which I'm gonna call A1, to a2, a3, dot, 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 because I don't have time to write infinitely many events down and I'm not gonna call them all different letters. I'm gonna use subscripts to make it easier. So I'm gonna call them all a1, dot, dot, dot. Um, so if they're all disjoint from each other, so we've gone over this before. So meaning that ai intersect aj is the empty set or i not equal to j. So if they're not the same set, then they have no intersection. They're all disjoint from each other. No two has any intersection at all. Um, so if this happens, then what we'd want as a new rule is that if I union up all infinitely many sets like this, then I still want to be able to just add their probabilities independently. So this is gonna look like this. So to be a probability function means that this needs to happen. Or if you're a grown up, um, you can use a grown up notation. This is more like the little babies. So, so grown ups would say the same thing like this. They would say, I'm gonna union, so they put a big giant union symbol, all the ANs where my index starts at one and goes infinitely forever. Um, 
So that's the same thing as the left side above. Um, and then on the right, this, this is an infinite sum. So how do we write an infinite sum? Well, in Calc 2, you learn this summation notation. So you say from one to infinity of, and what am I adding up? I'm not adding up the sets, I'm adding up the probabilities of the sets. So this is the, the new, this is the new rule. So if this happens, then it's a probability function um, for, for your infinite sample space. Okay, so let's do an example of a probability function with a nice infinite sample space. Um, so let's consider an experiment where we flip a coin until we get tails. Um, and then we'll record the outcomes as the number of flips until you got the tails, basically, right? So, so if it took me three tries to get tails, then I record a three. If it took me 10 tries to get my first tails, then I record a 10. So then what's my sample space? Well, I could flip a tail on the first try so that would mean it only took me one flip, or I could not get it on the first try, but I get it on the second try, or I don't get it on the first two tries, but I get it on the third try and so on like that. So you get this infinitely big sample space where any number, any positive number could be the number of flips until you get a tail. Um, so this is the sample space. So it's countably infinite. Um, and then let's think about a probability function on this sample space, but let's not assume it's a fair coin. So let's not assume the coin is fair. So we're just gonna assume that the, the probability of getting a tails for this coin Instead of saying it's one half automatically, let's just say it's some number p, where p is in between zero and one. So then what's the probability of getting a heads? Well, it has to automatically be one minus p because um, it is a coin, there's only two options. So just keep that in mind. Um, so this p is not the probability function that we're trying to that we're going to get this is just the probability function for just flipping a coin once okay so then now let's get the probability function for this sample space okay so define probability function on omega by, well, just like before, what I need to do is say the probability of any event, but what I can secretly do instead is, is figure out the probability of each outcome. But there's infinitely many. So what that means is I need a formula in general that will work for any number n, and then that'll define a probability function for me. Okay, so what's the probability of getting a one? Well, this is really just the probability of flipping tails because it's saying that I got my tails on my first try. So what's the probability of getting tails? Well, normally it's one half, but we're, not, we're assuming it's not necessarily a fair coin and we're just gonna call it P, little, little p, not, not capital P. Um, and then what's the probability of getting a two? That's really the probability of flipping a heads, then a tails. Because if I got a tails on my second try, that means I got a heads on my first try. 
So the probability of flipping a heads is one minus P and then flipping a tails, you multiply by P, right? So it's just like the multiplication property um, that you learn about in school. If you, if you want to know the probability of one thing happening and then another thing happening, you just got to multiply them together as long as they don't affect each other, which they don't because they're two different coin flips. So we just do that. Um, and then you can see the pattern. So probability of getting a three as the outcome is the probability of flipping heads, then heads, then tails. So that's just going to be one minus P, one minus P, and then P. Um, so what's the pattern here for N? Well, this is just going to be a bunch of H's, but how many? It's going to be N minus one of them, and then P for tails. Um, so that's the pattern, right? So there's two here before I get my third coin flip to be tails. And so if my nth coin flip is tails, that must mean I got heads n minus one times. Okay, so, so this defines my probability function for this sample space. Um, and then we still define P of A for any event A as just adding up the probability of the outcomes in A. And then this will automatically make the new rule or rule two. So I guess I can just call them two and three. Um, happen, just like it did before. So the only thing to check is actually that the total probability will be one. So how the heck do we do that? Well, I just need to add up all the probabilities of all the outcomes. That's just like we, what we did before. When it was finite, if it only went up to five things, we just had to add up the probability of those five outcomes and make sure they add up to one to make sure that this property happens. Um, but now it's infinitely many things, but luckily we've all taken calc two, so we can add up infinitely many things just fine. Okay, so what? how do we do this? Um, so we gotta do this to ensure P is a probability function. So what is it? Okay, well, the way to think about um, this is just adding up the probability of each outcome. So it's going to be an infinite sum here. And what are all these things? Well, p of 1, that was just p, little, little p, um, lowercase p. And p of 2 was 1 minus p times p. And p of 3 was 1 minus p squared times p. And then I guess p of 4 we didn't do, but that would be 1 minus p to the third times p plus dot, dot, dot forever in that same pattern. So what can we do? We can factor out um, p, and then something nice will happen after that. OK. So we get something like this. So here we have to remember, how do I add up infinitely many things? Well, I can't always do it. It just depends on, on the numbers. That's what you learn in Calc 2. So here, you actually can. So this is the infinite sum of 1 minus p to the n from 1 to infinity. Um, and then. Uh, oh, I'm off by one, sorry, sorry. So I also factored out a P from there. Sorry, so there's a one plus, there we go. So now this will make sense. This starts at zero, step. Okay. Um, so this is the infinite sum of one minus P to the N 
And this might be familiar. This is a geometric series. So you learn this in Calc 2, this little formula. If you have a number to the nth power and you add it up in, uh, to infinity, then it turns out to just be this, as long as r is um, between one and negative one, which it is here because p is a number from zero to one. So, so is one minus p. Okay, so we can use this formula, except instead of r, it's one minus p. So it's p times one over one minus one minus p. And those ones will cancel and the negative will cancel again. p over p is one, which is exactly what we wanted, good. Okay, so this is a probability function on an infinite uh, sample space. Okay, so I will see you next time. That's all for today.